It ain't the left side or the right side. Then it must be the fin side. Thank you, Solo D. Welcome to another episode of On the Fin Side here with Kat and Paul. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. I'm Brian Cat NFL on Twitter, and Paul is fanatic underscore pick. Paul and I are revisiting our top 26 Miami Dolphins specific draft board. So this is not our overall board. Uh, this is very specifically with a lens on where we value these players for the Dolphins. We did this a couple months ago. You're going to see a lot of changes here. But, Paul, before we get into that, Justin Herbert is one. We obviously got a lot of flack for not having on our last one. I'm going to get even more flack because I still don't have him in the top 26. Uh, there, there's a lot of talk right now that Herbert might be the pick at five. I still think it's going to be Tua. And uh, there's some talk as well about maybe even Jordan Love. So, what about you? Did did Herbert crack your top 26? He cracked my top 26, and mainly because, and, and I'll, I'll give you a hint, he barely cracked it. Mainly because the talent is hidden away in there. You see it when he's throwing against air. He looks the part. He does everything but when he's out on the actual game day field to, to show you that he's got it locked away in there somewhere so with three first round picks if you're telling me Miami can get him in the 20s and sit him a year behind Fitzpatrick have him compete with Rose and see who's got a little bit more ability and which one of the two can develop I can get behind that scenario and it doesn't feel like a wasted pick since they have two other first rounders but can I justify the fifth overall not a bit would I love it if they got him at 18 not really uh, there's guys I like more for this team. And that being the case, I don't think Miami's going to get him if they stuck to this draft board that I've got just because I don't think he's still there in the 20s. Well, without question, my favorite uh, part of the draft being over is going to be I don't have to talk about Herbert anymore uh, unless he's actually a Dolphin. And if he becomes a Dolphin, I've been very clear that uh, I don't want him to be the pick. Then That's it for me right there. I mean, I look, I, I'm not, I'm not going to – talk about Justin Herbert as if he's already failed, even though he's not the guy that I want at five. He has the arm talent. He has the athleticism. Everybody sees that. As a general rule of thumb, I don't like drafting a player and then trying to coach him up to be something that he completely wasn't in college. I think you got to – I prefer to tweak a player as opposed to change him. And I, I felt like his feet and his accuracy and his ability to just read the field and feel the game were not there at Oregon. But will that change with good coaching? Maybe. Uh, my my money is against it. Um, so Herbert does not go in the top 26 here for me. Other than that, Paul, other than Justin Herbert, who are some players that were noticeably missing from your top 26 board? One that I see frequently mocked to the Dolphins that, that I do not have on my top 26 board is, is Austin Jackson. I think that there are better tackle prospects than him. I think there's – at least six or seven better draft tackle prospects than him. I think he's got all the upside in the world, but tackle is not a position. We've got the luxury of waiting for somebody to turn into something. And that's where Austin Jackson is today. Uh, right right there with the you, man. Back, I, we've been vocal yeah. on not only Herbert, but Austin Jackson. And you know, it's funny listening to people talk about him because you talk about all these good qualities. Uh, he's 6'5", 322. He's got great character. Uh, oh, by the way, he can't block. Uh, so yeah. I'm not a big That's fan a of – look, I, I saw him against A.J. Epineza, Bradley, and I. He got destroyed. And those were – that was the best competition he faced all year, and he wasn't even close. So he's my OT10 oh, te right now. Technique wins, and he doesn't have it. Yeah. Or like, he needs it, to be it, completely it down to that. Right. But it's it's as it stands right now, technique wins. He doesn't have it. You don't draft a player in the first round that doesn't have technique. Right. It's like, hey, I like Patrick Queen, um, mm -hmm. but when you get in the league, he just doesn't know how to tackle. Like, no, that's right. a problem. <laughs> news, uh, new, news flash, though, he does. He does. He definitely knows how to tackle. So he does, and just, that might be a little bit of a, out there. of a spoiler <laughs> as as to, as to our board here. So. 
Paul, a, a few guys that jump out for me that that did miss. Um, in addition to Herbert, uh, Xavier McKinney just missed my list here. I I actually have three safeties I like more than him. I mean, McKinney's a good football player. I think 26 would still be a little high, but if we got to 39, I'd feel a little bit more comfortable there. I think he's he can he can fit into the role Minka was supposed to play, move around a little bit, but nothing eye popping as far as the skill set. Uh, I did not have any running backs, and yeah. I only had two wide receiver. Um, and I, I'd say anybody else that was kind of noticeable linebacker Kenneth Murray, I kept off the list too because I I think in this type of defense you really need to have those instincts and Murray is a very raw kind of seek and destroy type of type of inside linebacker so he, he's he's not somebody that that made it for me yeah and and so just to go through through the three things you just did I do have McKinney on there even though I prefer not uh, and that's not a detriment to McKinney it's more of a compliment to the players behind him in this draft and what I like about the safety position as well as Flores' coaching ability. Um, I do have two wide receivers, but I will say if we'd gone to 27, I would have had three. Um, and then as far as the running backs go, I don't think I've made any secret about it throughout this entire process. I like some of these top running backs I really do there's nothing to not like but again it's it's about fit it's about depth at the position and I hate to break it to folks but any running back that can get positive yardage on the carry or break a tackle occasionally is gonna look like Barry Sanders after last year that's for sure uh, the Dolphins <laughs> average 3.3 yards a carry and yeah for, for me I've Fitzpatrick. got Patrick. <laughs> yeah, and only you're right, only because of Fitzpatrick. And, and uh the the that three point three yards per carry I think was the second lowest in the last five years of, of any team. And that's with Fitzpatrick uh, accounting for probably what five yards a carry. <laughs> um so yeah, it's it it was not good. Uh yeah, I it, I've always liked the running backs a little higher. I like this group. I just have them between thirty and forty. I don't want the Dolphins to start the running back um run in the first round I, i'm fearful that they're going to take a deandre swift or a jk dobbins at 26 that's still a little bit too high for me i think what great value would be is is to see like a client edwards hilaire at 56 that that would certainly make my day but paul let's go ahead and jump right into this list here and we'll go we'll go three at a time to start off here and coming into 26 is michigan edge rusher josh uche six one uh 245 pounds very versatile kid. Uh, he's he's kind of that undersized edge rusher. Reminds me a lot of former Colt uh, Robert Mathis. He has a lot heavier hands and plays bigger than his size would indicate. He actually, you know, got a lot of depth when when rushing against uh, Tristan Wirf. So I, I was impressed by him. But in addition to having that 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 edge rusher, he he can also hold his own on the edge against the run a little bit, and he can also drive back into coverage. Next on my list there at uh, 25 is going to be Lloyd Cushenberry from LSU. I uh, dropped him a little bit uh, from our last time. Uh, what I like about him, even though he didn't have as great of tape as some of the other centers this past year, what I like about him is he snaps the ball quickly, gets into his stance, and uses his length. So I like him at center. He can also play right guard, but that, that's he has some traits that are really tough to teach. Then at 24, I've got uh, Zach Bond with the uh, edge rusher linebacker from Wisconsin. Uh, at the combine, he worked out as an off-ball linebacker, but he really brings it off the edge. I think he had 19 and a half tackles for loss this past year and 13 and a half sacks at Wisconsin. Uh, I think Brian Flores would have a ball coaching this guy, um, and, and especially with that intelligence and that versatility, and also following the Wisconsin pipeline there with Andrew Van Ginkle. Vince Beagle and now Vince, and, and now Zach Bond. I love that you brought up the Wisconsin pipeline because they they've got a hell of a pipeline. Even if you look at this year's draft, <clears throat> for me at 26, I went with Yator Gross Matos out of Penn State. I I think he is a guy that could provide some of that pass rush ability. I don't love the ability with him to drop in the coverage like you brought up with Uche or Bond, but. I, I do like him as a pass rusher. I, I think he gets undervalued and overvalued by a lot of people, but his, his sweet spot's right around the Dolphins' pick at 26. 
Uh, up next, I've got a guy we've already talked about in Xavier McKinney. Uh, barely making the list, but he is on here. Um, just because the Dolphins could use another safety, I'd be intrigued to see if they're able to convert Nick Needham, which eliminates the need for a safety. Um, but there's also a lot of safety depth later on, so I couldn't have Xavier McKinney higher. I've seen some mock drafts where the Dolphins grab him at 18, and that's as disturbing to me as grabbing a running back in round one. And, you know, I, I, I personally wouldn't go the McKinney route unless all else has failed, but, again, that's me. Uh, you've already brought up Zach Vaughn. I love the player, and that's why I've got him in here at 24 on my list. Got it. So we both got Vaughn at a – our bond at 24, 23 is going to be Grant Delp at the safety from LSU. And it's just fascinating because I've come full circle with him. I really liked him after 2018. And then he had a, he had a high ankle injury, terrible year tackling at the safety spot. And I started thinking, man, I wouldn't touch this guy until round three, but I, I watch him more. He's got incredible football IQ and great range. And I think if you put him, in between Xavier Howard and um, Eric Rowe and, and Byron Jones. Man, that really completes the secondary. It allows you to move Bobby McCain back down to the nickel spot. Then at, 20, at 22, coming in on my list here is uh, LSU linebacker Patrick Queen. Now, you know, I, and I posed this on Twitter the other day, and I got some snarky responses that, oh, we absolutely don't need an inside linebacker. And, and I agree with that. I mean, it's not a big need. Raquan McMillan and Jerome Baker played well last year. Not great, but they played well. And uh, they're only 23 and 24 years old. But are any of them really going to be a special player? I'm not quite sure. Um, Patrick Queen might be. And he, I compare him to former Bill and Bengal to Keo Spikes. The more I watched him, the more I realized he is in there, right in there on every play against the run and against the pass. Incredible intelligence. And then he goes to the combine and runs a four or five flat, which so he certainly passes the eye test there. Uh, so if if you can elevate the football IQ and get a ten year starter in Queen, it, it reminds me of kind of when the Patriots drafted Gerard Mayo several years ago. Um, and then I, I go back to the safety well at number twenty one with Antoine Winfield Jr. I mean, it, you know he's undersized. He's five nine two oh three, just just like his father was. Uh, he is a great football player, a great tackler, uh, and he, he certainly plays bigger than his size. He also has the ability to play free safety, strong safety, and in that nickelback role. If he can stay healthy, I, I think this might end up being one of the top 10 or 15 players in the entire draft. I do agree with you. I don't have him on my list, but I actually have a receiver coming in right here at 23. Uh, Rugs can take the top off of a defense. Uh, it's I know you you're a big fan of saying he can he can what is it run out of the building mm-hmm. and with a lot of guys and Rugs can do that and just light up the back end of a defense, open up everything underneath. And if you've got safeties worried about a player like Rugs going over the top, it opens up so much for the towers that Miami has at tight end wide receiver for the pain in the asses that they've got for the underneath as well in Jakeem Grant and Albert Wilson and Ruggs is a player that could open up the entirety of the offense with his speed alone and that alone is exciting for me after love or or, sorry after after Ruggs I've got Justin Herbert sliding in here at, at 22 We've talked about him enough already. I'm I'm kind of good with that. If you are, oh, I'm good. And with that. you know, if 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 I just pissed off the Justin Herbert fans, I'm about to piss off another, you know, half of our fans listening right now. Um, at 21, I have Tua Tagovailoa. Um, injury concerns have been a problem for me all along throughout the process. Do I think the talent is there? Absolutely. I really do. He is a guy that is tumbling. There are teams that have taken him completely off their board before the Wonderlick leaks, uh, which I guess he apparently actually got a 19, not a 13. So, uh, and I know that's overrated, but you know what? It's, it's another piece of the puzzle for me that just has me shying away from Tua. And I hate to say it, he might still be there 
at 21st overall if he's tumbling on a lot of boards like we think like a few folks think he is right now you never know with that i mean it it, it sounds good to go in in the top five but when people are like look with that hip we can't work him out we we just can't pull the trigger i mean it, it wouldn't be the most shocking thing especially in this type of year so paul has come out with and just be- before we move on to one thing i want to say to our listeners it's something i put out there on twitter it's yeah, we've got hype videos that look good of Tua and his agent saying he's freaking great. You know how I take it when when a player's agent says they look great? I take it the same way as when a mom shows off her, you know, four-year-old's coloring project. It's, oh, this looks amazing. Oh, yeah, you can totally tell it's a fire truck if you tell me because there's some red in that scribble somewhere. You know, it, it's just... I don't. So the guy that makes a percentage of your paycheck is trying to sell you. No kidding. You're you're joking right now, right? Don't and, and nobody take it all hates. Value. Nobody hates coloring books more than the On the Fin Side podcast. So we we, we just we are make anti that coloring clear. book. No that, more that, coloring books here on On the Fin Side. Adult kids, I don't care. That, that, that's right. So we're we're keeping it real here. Just a week before the uh, before the draft. I mean, Paul comes you don't out. You much get much more raw than coloring book. Hater. I mean, yeah. I mean, Paul comes out and 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 it talks about Herbert and Tua just just middle fingers up to everybody uh, throughout throughout this list. I am and, Brian effing Cox right now. Yeah, and and now people Buffalo. thought you thought four year olds and coloring books were safe. Not the case here a week before the draft. Middle fingers to them too. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, let's keep going here before we uh, we could we could really uh, uh keep it real if we wanted to. Uh, uh, Twenty is Jerry Judy for me. Um, I actually think he's he's one of the more overrated players in this class. He, look, he's a he's a fantastic player. Um, and one thing that he specializes in is you know he's not the biggest guy. He's not even the fastest guy. He's an incredibly nimble route runner. I mean, it's special to watch. Um, I, I have some questions about how he plays through contact. And, you know, w- when you start talking about this guy is, I mean, he, on our consensus board, he's the seventh overall player in the draft. I just find that way, way too high. But he can play in the slot and, and get some separation there. So if he's a value pick at 18, I think I'd be able to live with it, but he still wouldn't be one of the highest players on my board. At 19 is Ashton Davis from California. And it's a shame for this guy because after being a walk-on at California uh, and moving his way all the way to the top, there was some talk about this guy maybe going in the first round. I would still be okay taking him with that 26th pick. Uh, new D- Dolphins defensive backs coach uh, Gerald Alexander coached him at Cal last year. He has great range. Um, he just didn't get a chance to show it off because he, he had some injuries, so he wasn't at the Senior Bowl he wasn't uh, at, at the combine, but I think if he were, we would be talking about him as a first-round draft pick. Um, then uh, at number 18, uh, somebody that that I've I've liked throughout the process here, and he's my OT six, and that's Ezra Cleveland from Boise State. I remember watching him the f- first couple of games and th- and thought, you know, there's really not much to this guy. He looks like a he looks like a more athletic version of Sam Young out there at left tackle, but. As I got to my like fifth or sixth game of him, I was like, you know, nothing's getting through ever. So, and then he goes to the combine. He he runs a four nine at at six six uh, three ten. I think if he beefs up, we might be talking about a Joe Staley type of player. Uh, if if the Dolphins can get Ezra Cleveland at twenty six, if he falls that far, I think that is a home run draft pick, and it allows you to solidify both sides of the offensive line, assuming you drafted a tackle earlier um before that 26 pick too yeah and at number 20 uh, i've got cj henderson Uh, i don't have cornerbacks rated as highly as some folks on my list here but they're rated higher for me if they can play in the slot than they are if they can play on the boundary it's if you're just a boundary guy for me you drop a few points if you're a slot guy well you got a little more value because with miami signing byron jones and with Xavier Howard on the other side. I can't justify a boundary corner, no matter how good they are. But C.J. Henderson definitely fits the mold. After Henderson at 19 and then 18, I'll domino the two right together because we talked about them a little bit already. But I've got Kenneth Murray out of Oklahoma and Patrick Queen 
uh, rounding that out. Yeah, so you, you mentioned it's interesting on Henderson because I left him off my list because I didn't think he could play slot, but may, maybe you saw some snaps that I didn't there. Um, yeah, but H- Henderson, I'll tell you what too. I have him. I have him in my mock draft going seventh to the Panthers. I think he's going to get shoved up the board a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he's certainly a very good cover corner, and if 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 he is available, you know, somehow later, you know, later in the first round, you you never know. I mean, you can never have enough cornerbacks here in the NFL. Um, so now we're down to, we're making our way through the list here, down to 17, uh, went with center from Michigan, Cesar Ruiz. Um, I, I kind of, I, I go back to what PFF said about the guy that was just right on is that it's more important for you as an offensive lineman to not lose, uh, consistently than it is to dominate the person in front of you. I'm not sure if that's their exact quote, but. I found that to be right on. Uh, and Cesar Ruiz did not allow a sack this past year. He's 6'3", 315 pounds. He can play center or guard. And he's not going to be 21 years old till June. Uh, so you're talking about somebody with, with a, a lot of upside, a lot of youth. And I think you're talking about easy, a 10-year starter. Um, what was CeeDee Lamb at uh, 16? He's my... He's my wide receiver one here, and the the last remaining wide receiver I'm going to have on here reminds me of DeAndre Hopkins with a little more uh, ability to break tackles, too. So wide receiver, not a big need, but, man, if he falls down to 18, uh, which I don't expect, then that becomes a different conversation. Yeah, for me, at at, um, next up, I've got Jeff Akuda. I love Jeff Akuda. I think he was top five player in this draft, whether he goes in the top five or not. It's he is a very special talent on the boundary. He's just not going to crack the lineup with with Jones and, and Xavier Howard. After him, I've got AJ Epineza. Uh I think he's such a perfect fit in this Flores defense, given his ability to rush the passer, play with power, and hold the point of attack against the run. Uh, I just think he's a no-brainer if he happens to be there. I, I'd struggle to pass on him at 18, even though I do think he, there's more and more chance that he's going to be on the board. And then I've got Christian Fulton sliding in ahead of, of Jeff Okuda. My thing with Fulton is he screams a guy that can transition to the interior to play the slot and be a lights-out slot corner. Because Miami's going to have five, six DBs more often than a lot of teams do. So having that guy that can play that inside position um, has a lot of value here. And that slots him above Akuda on the Dolphins board, even though I think Akuda is the better player in the end. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with you too. I mean, we, we both had Akuda ranked very high in our top four, both of us in our last one. That was before they signed Byron Jones. And it's nice that you sign Byron Jones here. You don't have to worry about the outside corner position. But if you want to take that level to dominate in the secondary you, and you come away with a Christian Fulton wherever he goes, then that that could be something special. I accidentally only named off two in my last one here. So I'm still at 15. So I'm going to name off four right here. Um, 15 go is AJ Epineza from Iowa, just like you said. I, I think he's, I think he needs to beef up and just be who he is and be a 6'5", 290 pound interior uh, player who who kind of plays that JJ Watt role uh, and and takes on ta- and, and harasses the guards and the tackles. Just don't don't have him be out, you know be in a stand up position or, or be an edge rusher. He's not that type of player. Didn't work out well. But I didn't expect him to. He's not a great athlete. He's just he, he's a power player, and you know I, he had double digit sacks here in each of the last two years at, at Iowa. I, I think we'd we'd be talking about him a little bit higher if he didn't get hurt in the first part of last season. Um, then coming in for me next is going to be uh, Josh Jones, the tackle from Houston. Um, I, I've always been a little bit higher on him than you, and I can see why people have have an issue with him. He is not at all the most technically refined guy, but he also went to Houston too. I mean, we're, we're not talking about somebody who went to LSU or Florida State, uh, but why did I say Florida State? Just LSU or Alabama. Um, the but, but he didn't but, go to Florida State either. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, man, he uh, he was very good uh, in pass protection. He's got athleticism. He's nasty. I just think he needs to use his hands a little better, and I think that can be coached up. So I so I do like Josh Jones there. Um, th- then coming in next at thirteen is Caleb Von Chesa. Now I don't expect this to be a player that Brian Flores is going to love. Um, I could be wrong on that. I mean. He he is in he he's somebody that even though as Paul said in our last show he's got a better overall game than I I may have given him credit for he's going to make his money winning to the outside shoulder of the tackle and I don't know if the Dolphins are looking for that uh, on their defense so but I I think he's a phenomenal talent only 20 years old he missed the 2018 season with an injury in 2019 uh, he. Toward the end of the year, you watch his last three games. You're, you were looking at, at potentially a dominant pass rusher there. So then, then uh, at number twelve, um, a little bit of a surprise, uh, probably, and, and this might piss off some people, but it, that's kind of a theme for the show here. Uh, Isaiah Simmons, I, I dropped a little bit here too because, look, I, I, I think it just takes so much for an off the ball linebacker or safety to justify that selection. As an example, I mean, look, Jamal, Jamal Adams is on the trade block now. He was the sixth overall pick of the Jets a few years ago, and he's become a top three safety. And now the Jets would probably take a mid to late first rounder for him. And, and it shows you that type of positional value. I don't think he's going to come in and be a dominant player at four positions all over the defense like a lot of people think. I also don't expect him to fall to – to that Dolphins 18 spot. Uh, there's some rumblings. He may go as high as three to the Lions. So, Paul, next for you. So, at number 14, I have the guy that you're higher on than I am, Josh Jones, uh, mainly due to the priority I have for the tackle spot for the Dolphins in this year's draft. It's Do I love Josh Jones? No. Do – I love the idea of leaving the position vacant if Miami whiffs on the top four offensive tackles. I hate that even worse. So, yeah, having Josh Jones there is better than a gaping hole or anything they have on the roster today. But ahead of Josh Jones, I've actually got Ezra Cleveland uh, right here. I know you've mentioned him earlier. I actually have him suddenly higher than you do, which surprised me a little bit. And then I've got Kalevon Chase on rounding it out at 12. Yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, th- that's the, the those are players we've eyed. And, and I'm as long as we're on the same page with Austin Jackson, uh, then then we're good to go, which we don't like him. Um, <laughs> number 11 for me is, uh, is going to be Jeff Akuda. You know, we've talked about him. Great player. Only drop him on the list here because of the positional need. He would be fourth if the Dolphins did not sign Byron Jones. I think he'll be a fantastic player, and I think the Lions are crazy if they don't draft him there at number three unless they can get a trade down. Then uh, next on the list at number 10 is going to be Javon Kinlaw, the defensive tackle from South Carolina. I've had him as high as seven on this board. There's some sudden questions with knee injuries with him, and it, it certainly bears watching. But other than that, I mean, you, a great story, a very hardworking kid. And, you know, he reminds me a little bit of um, new Indianapolis called DeForest Buckner. He's got great length. And I think on that defensive line with Christian Wilkins and Davin Gotcha, who are not great pass rushers, but good players, Kinlaw might be able to bring something a little bit different with that size and that pass rushing ability there. And number nine. Uh, is going to be a Makai Becton from Louisville. Um, great, great size. Um, there are some questions with him, though. I mean, uh, he's he's somebody that could not complete a workout when he first came to Louisville. Uh, and you have to worry, is this going to be a kid that eats his way out of the league? Are we going to talk about a 400-pound guy who can't complete a drill in a couple of years? I don't think that'll be the case, but that's always going to be in the back of your mind compared to these other tackles who are – you know, great athletes, 315, 320 pounds. But, man, what a talent he is. He is. But for me here at 11, I have Brown. I know he's a monster defensive tackle. We've talked at length about how raw he is. But, again, it's I think he's a better player than where I have him. But as far as a need for the Dolphins, 
I can't rank him any higher than 11. Coming in right ahead of him, I finally have Jordan Love, who wound up being my QB2 uh, on this list. And I would be understanding if Miami dra- grabbed him at five, given the, the scenario. I'd prefer a little later. I really am not sure where he ends up falling. I know we've talked at length on air, off air, you name it. Everybody knows who he who he is. And then right ahead of him, I have C.D. Lamb. I You compared him to DeAndre Hopkins. For me, he's a little bit more of that vintage Larry Fitzgerald, not the old man Larry Fitzgerald that's still mm. good, but the vintage Larry Fitzgerald from when he was all world and, and just the guy. And as talented as Miami is at wide receiver, there's a place for that. There, there really truly is. I think he is the one guy that has been underrated at wide receiver throughout this entire process. Yeah, and if you've got him as, you know, if if you've got him ninth on your board, then I'd imagine as an overall prospect, you've probably got him as a top five player overall. Uh, I don't have him as a top five, but... Or pretty close. We could, it's, it's I, I if you tell me he's, ten, I, I've got him pretty true to where he is on mine. Okay. Uh, okay. A lot of my, a, a lot of my top 10, is is pretty close to real world top ten, uh, and and you know me, you know I account for every scenario on the planet to the point I drive you nuts sometimes um, with it. it. It's you know, and and there are times where hey, it doesn't pan out, but there are times where Laramie Tunzel has video of a gas mask pop out right before the draft. It's or Makai Becton has a flag sample at the combine has has come out today uh as we're recording this so you know there there are things that happen there are times where the media overrates a player compared to where the nfl teams have them and so i tried to keep this as true to the top 10 as possible but again there's a, there's a lot of guys that i think you could na- name off you could probably name my top eight if you wanted to if you really thought about it and we're writing down who i said so far uh, who I've got ahead of CD on my Dolphins board. Yeah, and CD is is somebody that you know. If yeah, they've got Devontae Parker, they've got Preston Williams. But if you think he's that special, then you, you're willing to break the rules for him. Uh, and I can certainly yeah, respect role. that. And I do think he will be the first wide receiver off the board. So we're making our way through the list here. We're we're down to number eight, and I do have Derek Brown there. I've moved him really between eight and 15 throughout the last couple of months, I I put him at the very top that I would, Uh, you know, I'm not crazy about drafting a deep defensive tackle this high usually, but I think he might be the Aaron Donald answer to nose tackle. I mean, you watch him play at six, five, three twenty five. The word that just comes to mind is disruptive, disruptive, disruptive. Every play he's disrupting it. I think he needs to, play a little bit more under control and just use that brute strength and when he does man can he can he wreck a lot of plays and and in this division that you know really not a lot of great centers in the AFC East I mean Mitch Morris is a good player for the Bills but um who the, the Jets Jets signed uh, what Connor, Connor McGovern is a pretty good player too but either way these undersized nose tack are centers in the division Derek Brown could certainly have a field day with Number seven, and this is where my run on tackles begins here, and I, I went with J- uh, with uh, Jedrick Wills from Alabama um, he, here at number seven. Technically, he is, uh, to me, the, by far the best tackle in the draft. He, he had the best tape for me. Um, what where I, I'm not going to say I'm docking him because he's so close with the others, but he's strictly a right tackle. Yeah, he could probably play left tackle, but he hasn't, unlike the other guys. And uh, he, he's a great technician and a great athlete, too. And if you want to look at the difference between him and another potential first-round pick next year in Alex Leatherwood, watch K- the LSU game. Caleb Von Chason is destroying Alex Leatherwood. And then for some reason, he flips over to the right side, and, and Jedrick Wills was just not having it. So I, I think, too, this player gets even more valuable if Tua – ends up being the pick. A, because you can protect him, and B, to a gushes about this guy. Number six, Andrew Thomas from Georgia at, at left tackle. Now, 
He's somebody throughout the process that seems to be slipping a little. For most people, he's their OT4, but he's always been my first or second guy. And even though he's not the pure um, handler of speed rushers at, at left tackle, that, that maybe the other guys have more of a capability of being, he is a brute force and run blocking and he only allowed one sack last year. So he's just not, this is not somebody who is getting killed by speed rushers too. In a worst case scenario, he started at right tackle 13 games at Georgia as a freshman. It did very well there too. And at his size and with his run blocking, he might be able to play some guard. For me at number eight, I've got a guy who looks like he's wearing shoulder pads when he's in a sleeveless t-shirt. It's if you want to talk about a guy like just and we're just talking looks before we even get to the ability here. He looks like a caricature you would draw of a football player for a cartoon strip. Uh, he is just so big and strong and visibly uh, massive at the on, along that defensive line, and that's Javon Kinlaw. Came out to the Senior Bowl where several folks that are being talked about in the top ten were present. And throughout the week, he was the best player there. Uh, injury kept him out of the game. But Javon Kinlaw is a disruptive, destructive player along that defensive front. And I'd be willing to spend a very high pick to make sure he was in Miami, despite the two needs I have for Miami as being above all others in this draft. After him, I start my run on tackles. And I start with Andrew Thomas here. Or, I'm sorry, before that, I, I, I skipped completely over number seven, which is where I have Isaiah Simmons ranked. Still going to piss some people off, but just remember where Cat had him ranked when, when you put the comments. Uh, but, yeah, and then I go to my run on tackles at number six in, in Thomas. It's he – Miami needs a tackle in this draft, at least one if not two. And if they come out of this draft without a left tackle, I don't care if it's one of these top four. I don't care if it's Josh Jones. I don't care if it's a trade for Trent Williams. If Miami doesn't come out of this draft with a left tackle above all other positions, it is a failure on their part to do so. I'm right there with you. And with that group of tackles, I mean, I think really when you get past the first four guys, you still have some talent there. But the Dolphins need two tackles, not, and they need two tackles badly. And I think when mm-hmm. you get into that, you know, OT5 through OT12, which is very, very deep, it, it becomes a little bit of a flip of the coin of whether or not this, this guy is going to, uh, whether it's Josh Jones or Ezra, Ezra Cleveland, because it becomes a little bit more of a flip of the coin than, than these top guys. So right there with you, Paul. So now we're up to our top five, and we'll go one by one on these. My number five guy is Iowa, Iowa tackle Tristan Werfs. He is – very closely ranked with the other guys, but, uh, you know, just as solid as you can get at the right tackle spot. And when Alaric Jackson went down for Iowa, he moved over to left tackle, and, and he very much looked the part there, too. And he's also got the bar, get the body of an offensive guard. So, again, with some of these tackles here, and this is another added layer here, is it's it's with how talented they are and versatile they are, unless they get hurt or they, you get caught with, you know, 20 pounds of weed like Greg Robinson, the odds of them busting out of the league are are basically zero. Paul, who's your number five? My number five, or as, you know, if really, it's like Andrew Thomas was 3D. Uh, This is 3C for me, and that's Jedrick Wills, who you've already talked about uh, a bit. Uh, It's, you know, the left tackle position. It's so critical, and there's four guys sitting right at the top. Yeah, yeah, there's there's no doubt about that. Number four is going to be Utah State quarterback Jordan Love. And it's because of the positional value. And and I think the big question to ask with Love is, do you believe that he just dramatically declined this past year? Or do you think it was a result of him getting a new coaching staff and, and losing nine players on offense. I mean, what I saw from Jordan Love throughout a football game, and if you watch that LSU game, that's a prime example of it, is he he, he was pretty accurate and under control throughout the, the beginning of the game. But as the game went on and it went from, you know, 6-6 to 13-6 to six to 20-6 to six, because of the supporting cast around him, he would get more and more frustrated. 
and that that's there's something to be said about that. So if you believe that you're going to get your the 2018 Jordan Love, and I think that you will, then he, all day every day he can be that developmental prospect, and I think he would fit in really well in Chad Gailey's offense as well as in the quarterback room there with Ryan Fitzpatrick. Yeah, and I I can't argue with you there. I mean, for me, I've already gotten love off my board. I went with 3B at number four, which is Tristan Wirfs. Uh, I, I do like the fact that he can kick over the right tackle, and he's the one guy out of the top four that if Miami were able to take two of them, I want Wirfs to be one of the two because of the fact that I think while he can play left tackle, he's going to be dominant at right tackle, and the other guys are going to be better set at left tackle. And number three is, no surprise, it's going to be Tua. And believe it or not, uh, for the last six months, I have not moved him from the number three spot. Uh, so the hip injury did not even lower him for me. And and here's the big question when it comes to him. is, And, and these arguments on Twitter kill me because you have, uh, yeah, he's injury prone. No, he's not injury prone. Blah, blah. Of course he's injury prone. I mean, look, look at everything that's happened to him. My question is, knowing that he's injury prone, are you willing to take the risk? And for me, it is a yes, especially on a roster where you have 14 draft picks this year and an extra first and a second next year. So my hope is that if the Dol- unless the Dolphins can trade up for Joe Burrow, which it doesn't look like that's going to happen, then my second choice is to stay put at number five and take Tua. But I have gotten to the point where – Two is really my 3A, and Jordan Love is my 3B. So if Jordan Love ended up being the pick, I don't expect that, um, then then I would be perfectly fine with that. Just, again, I don't want Justin Herbert. <laughs> um, <laughs> Paul, three for you. Uh, can, can we make not Herbert a selection here? Because I think that probably would get slotted pretty high on both of our boards. Mm-hmm. Uh, not even not even an actual name, just not Herbert. If If the commissioner walked up to the podium at five and said, at number five, the Dolphins take, well, oh, it just says they refuse to take Justin Herbert. And I think we'd be like, hey, you know what, okay, but that's fine. <laughs> so, um, in all seriousness, though, it, it's – I know we had the flag sample from the Combine. I don't care. He has so much physical potential and upsize – or upside, Jesus. You, you have to throw the word size in there with everything with this guy. It's – Makai Becton, I think, could, has the potential to turn into one of the most dominant left tackles in the league, a guy you're going to have to struggle to find cap space for at the end of his contract. But I think taking a chance on Makai Becton, I would take him at five all day, every day, every draft. I don't care if he shows up with a gas mask on right at the dra- you know, on virtual dr- for the draft, like not even a recording, an actual gas mask with a cloud puffing out around it. <clears throat> I find a way to forgive him. Well, he he might show up with a gas mask and uh, and a cheeseburger. I mean, it, it, look, did it surprise anybody that this guy got the munchies all the time? I mean, <laughs> it, it should not be a shock to anybody. There, the good news is uh, you, you can smoke weed in the NFL now. So it, that, and, and I, I'm being serious here. A, I, it goes into a whole different thing. I I, I have no problem with with a player doing it anyway. And you most know, of them do. Let's face it, or oh, a lot yeah. do. A, yeah, a lot it's, do. It's, yeah, it, performance enhancing drug, car. my ass. I mean, uh, uh, Ricky, Ricky Williams did it to heal his body. I guess you could go that route. Anyway, let's uh, rounding out the list. Shouldn't be a surprise. Paul, I'll just finish it out. Chase Young is number two, and Joe Burrow is number one. And I'm sure your list does not look any different. No, it's it's you and I both know before the season last year, when Burrow was a projected fifth round pick, I was saying based on the little bit I saw him technique wise and the upside I saw on him. And and this was before, you know, Tua had his latest incident that involved a walker. It's, I would have passed on Tua knowing that Burrow was out there and grabbed Burrow quote unquote early to ensure you got him. Um, And fortunately or came out and just lit the entire world on fire this past year and in in a way that no one else ever has and he did it playing half games pretty much um which is even more insane when you look at at, at the splits for it 
so yeah, I, I love Chase Young at number two. Let's not skip over him. Arguably the best player in the draft to a lot of folks. And he, he has a special ability to rush the passer. But Burrow has a special ability that, that doesn't come around very often uh, at, at a, the most key position on a football team. So I would give up a lot to go and get Burrow if the Bengals are biting. And that includes selling Burrow on the idea that he wants to pull an L way with the Bengals and force their force his way to Miami. Yeah. I, I got to a point where, you know, off the air, I was kind of like uh, a couple of months ago, I'm like, dude, shut up about Joe Burrow. Like I just, Oh, you were, just, <laughs> yeah, you were. <laughs> so I was like, I, and then finally I'd say about a month and a half ago, I got to the point where I said, you know, I'm going to put it at about 10 or 15% that the dolphins move move up for him. Um, I'm kind of trending down now. I, what I think happened is the Dolphins called and said, hey, we'll offer you our three first-round picks. And the Bengals said, sorry, you're not even close. Joe Burrow is going to be our pick. And that was that. Was that. that I don't have any inside sources on that. That's just my guess of what happened because you're not hearing a lot on that front. I think at this point it would be a pretty big shock if Joe Burrow were not the number one pick of the Bengals. I, I I have to I have to ask this. I know we're on the air, and you know, feel free to tell me to delete it after before we post this episode. I have to ask this: How many times did I ask you to watch Burrow play early in the season, and you're like, just piss off, just just stop it, just just stop it? And I'm like, no, go watch, it. just go watch him, go watch him. Yeah, How many times yeah, a lot. And, and I, I remember just, too oh. at the at the beginning of the year. <laughs> I mean, LSU played a really tough schedule, but a lot of those games came at the end of the year. I'm like, no, no, dude, I don't, I don't need to see this guy play Ball State. Like, I'll, I'll watch him later in the year. So, in my defense, I never said that I didn't like Burrow, anything like that. I said, hey, oh no, 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 you this didn't. is, yeah, is, is that? Uh, look, last year was he played for LSU. He did. I mean, he was just average. And you like, you saw something, and 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 you told me about him. Um, but I thought, you know what, I, I'm really going to see later in the year when he plays Florida, when he plays Auburn, when he plays these really good football teams, because I'm going to know everything that I need to know on there. Uh, and man, did he answer the call. 60 touchdowns, 5,700 yards. Um, and, and that's one thing I want to mention, too. I don't mean to go on a tangent, but Joe Burrow threw for about 5,700 yards last year. I think 280 of them came on screen passes. Justin Herbert threw for 3,456 yards and 720 something of them over 21% came on screen passes too. Nothing wrong with a screen pass, but uh, it's, it's a, it's a pass you or I could throw. Uh, so yeah. that, that factors and, into it too. Burrow is reading the field and th- that's what impresses me most about him. Yeah, it was one year, but the dominance he showed this wasn't Colt Brennan at Hawaii 10 years ago where you know that, hey, it's a college offense. He was making NFL reads and making accurate NFL throws over the linebacker, behind, uh, behind the linebacker and, and in front of the safety. And that's and what ha- would have me excited the most. That and he plays with probably the biggest set of balls at quarterback that I can remember in, in, in recent history. He really, truly does. I mean, he just walks out on the field and swings them around um, in a way that doesn't come across as being a jackass. And, you know, and and this is – he's good enough that it doesn't come across being a jackass when he handed that game ball back to Ed Orgeron and said, I'll take one for the national championship, not before, as far as, as, as the goddamn game ball in the college playoffs. I, mean, <laughs> I do. I, I love his personality. I love his personality. And I'll tell you what, I'll disagree with you there. I think he's a prick on the field, and I mean that in a good way. Uh, oh, yeah. He, he wants, I mean, and, and I think Todd McShay said this, or somebody, I, I listened to a lot of podcasts, but they said, he's this guy wants to absolutely rip your soul out when he's playing when he's playing quarterback. If he, if he throws five touchdowns, he's not going to be like, well, you know, we're up by 35, let's be quiet. No. I want to throw a 30 yard touchdown on the next play as well. So he's mm-hmm. that that's the kind of attitude you're looking for. And it's, it's, it's the same kind of attitude Pat Mahomes brings to the quarterback position that nonstop f- pedal to the metal, uh, 
want to score at all times type of attitude. So, yeah, I, I, I love everything about the guy. And Mahomes, though, Mahomes is going to be out there. He's like, I'm going to have fun and see what I can do to score. Like, and, and that's not to take anything away from Mahomes. It's Burroughs out there. I'm going to score, and I'm going to crush your damn spirit to the point your kids cry about it if I have to to get there. That's and right. It, it, it's, and you can't tell me if Flores were to get a captain and a quarterback <laughs> that wants to basically beat the living hell out of you on any given play. I, I can't and be able to back that up. There would be no better quarterback coach combination in my mind, anyway, than well, Flores and Burrow. Well, and I'll, I'll leave it on that note here. We've we've uh, we've covered a lot here, and and Joe Burrow is uh, uh, certainly going to be the number one pick in the draft by somebody, probably the Bengals. But yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. And this whole show, I mean, I, I don't, I can't recall us ever being so mean to children on one show, but I, I think, I think it works. I think we pulled it off here. So uh, that will, that will do it for our breakdown of our top 26 board revisited. Um, and we're going to have some great content. Be sure to go back and look at our positional breakdowns. We've covered a lot here in the draft season. We've loved doing it, especially with what's going on out there in the world. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Check out um, our merch store on thefinside.threadless.com. I'm Brian Cat NFL, and Paul is fanatic underscore pick on Twitter. And if it's not on the right side and it's not on the left side, it is on the fin side. So, do you take us home? It ain't the left side or the right side, and it must be the fin side. Fin side. It ain't the left side, left side or the right, right side. side, and it must be the fifth left. Listen, Dolphins fans across the land all tuning in to see what Brian Cat and Paul about to do.